your family, your community, your country, your responsibility. Be the best citizen you can be. Click on the Leader Say banner on this website to find out about your rights and responsibilities. The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Reedy Clappy. Chris, good morning. Hey, good morning, Reddy. Hi there. Um, tell me, have you had horse meat lately? We have our own meat issues here. We don't know what we're eating. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably generalizable around the world, actually. The answer is not knowingly, but almost certainly. And that's the big problem in this country, that people are already slightly sceptical of the food industry in the wake of what happened in the 80s and 90s with BSE. And everyone was reassured... People died, unfortunately, but uh, now things have moved on and everyone thought they could trust the food they were eating. And now they're finding out that what it says on the packet isn't necessarily what is in the packet. Now, while what is in the packet may not be unsafe health-wise because there's nothing wrong with eating horse meat, it's no worse or better than eating lamb, beef or whatever. But people are being defied by the package labelling. And if you can't trust the package labelling, then can you really trust the people who are supplying the food to make sure they're giving you good quality food that you think you're paying for? And it's really eroded confidence in supermarkets and supply chains here. I think looking at some numbers I saw just the other day, the numbers of people or the number of burgers being sold in supermarkets is down 50% in a week. And that's in Tesco's, which is one of the biggest retailers. So ready meals are down burgers are down anything where you can be slightly dubious because you can't see the meat coming off the bone people are are now skeptical about whether they can trust this stuff now now uh, chris i'm very fascinated by the science of it i mean to mix one meat with the other is is that not expensive how is it done so that it all looks like one product well the thing is uh, if you look at where these meats tend to be cropping up they're cropping up in mixtures so in things like ready meals which are already full of salt and other strong flavors they're cropping up in burgers and again there are lots of other flavorants other things in there and so you're not effectively eating something that would be recognizably a steak you're eating something which is mixed up meat and if you dilute these things in different proportions and then put lots of strongly flavored other things in with them and seasoning it's really hard to to detect other things that are in there i mean if you make a uh, a shepherd's pie and use lamb you will actually find that people struggle to distinguish the lamb in it from if you make the same dish and use beef Uh, Because once you've got all of the other things in there, flavours all blend in and they all taste great. Uh, I think that it's more that people are concerned about, well, if I can't trust what Mm. I think I'm being told I'm being fed, can I trust what else it says, such as, is there something in here that's going to be bad for me? And it's really eroded confidence in a a massive way. I, I, I can't believe that, you know, three weeks on from when this first exploded... It's still going on. I thought that it would be done and dusted in a few days, but the more they dig into this, the worse it seems to be. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's go to Elizabeth then in Santon. Hi there, Elizabeth. Hello. Good morning. Mm. I would like to ask the naked scientist. Was he a naked scientist? Whatever. Yes, yes Elizabeth. Whatever. Is it det- detrimental to one's health to cook with tinfoil? And may I listen on the radio? Yes, Elizabeth, thank you. And he is the naked scientist. Thank you very much for calling. (laughs) Yes, Chris? Although I'm wearing some clothes today, (laughs) has been known. (laughs) The whole point about tinfoil, tinfoil is made of aluminium, so it's a slightly iffy name, another maybe labelling deception, but it's actually aluminium foil. And used appropriately, it's probably perfectly safe. Aluminium is quite hard to make things react with it, but... That's not always the case. And there is some evidence that if you cook very acidic food, and I'm thinking things like rhubarb, if you cook that in an aluminium baking tray, if you ask people in the catering industry, they will tell you that they have to do much less washing up when cooking has been done in an aluminium baking tray with very acidic food like rhubarb, making rhubarb crumble, for example, than when you cook other things. And this is because the acid does attack the aluminium a bit, and this means that some of the aluminium dissolves off and goes into the food. Now, is that a health risk? Might be. We don't know. There's some association between aluminium and the damage in the brain that you see in Alzheimer's disease. So if you look in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, you see these 
plaques, which are deposits or aggregates of protein material. And in the core of those, you can find aluminium, leading some people to suggest that perhaps aluminium is at the heart of this. But the thing is, people don't tend to do that sort of cooking with aluminium foil, and it tends to go over the top of food. It doesn't tend to go underneath very acidic food, and therefore it's very unlikely that very much aluminium will be imparted into the food from the foil. So whether, regardless of whether aluminium is linked to Alzheimer's disease in the context of it getting into the food chain, the amount that's probably imparted to food by foil it will be low, mm -hmm. and therefore any health impact is very much likely to be low. All right, there you have it, Elizabeth. Our lines are open for you. Please call us 21 446 We're taking your SMSs on 31702 and 31567. When we return, I have a question about facial hair. The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Reedy Clappy. All right, let's go straight to the lines on 021-446-0567-011-8830702. Let's go to Sam in Randburg. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, um, I would like to know how many billions of viruses do we need to compound together to be able to see them with the naked eye? And if these things are animals, do they make noise? Hi, Sam. So a virus is very small. And they range from 30 nanometers, or thereabouts, which is about one thirty thousandth of a millimeter, right up to something which is about half a millimeter across. Uh, so, not half a millimeter, half a micron, 500 nanometers, so 10 times bigger. Even so, they are still absolutely tiny, and at that size, they are actually smaller almost than the light we try and see them with, the visible light we try and see them with. So you can't really see them with a microscope. The biggest ones you almost can. You need an electron microscope to see a an individual virus. So how many would you have to put together? Well, you've got to get the number of viruses so that when you shove them all together, they become resolvable by a light microscope for you to be able to see them with your naked eye. And that would mean at putting together enough to end up with something of the order of half a millimetre or so across, so that you could see them with the naked eye, or of, a, of maybe um, probably half a micron to do it with a microscope. So if we di divided it, it all out, then assuming you could organise them all very nicely, then if you had 100 or so viruses lined up side by side and then in each direction, so you had a square of them, about 100 by 100, you ought to be able to pick that up with a microscope. But you wouldn't be able to resolve any detail, you'd just see a sort of blob there. You'd need an electron microscope to see it any more clearly than that. So they're really tiny. Um, you, you could cram millions of them on the head of a pin. And actually, I went to a lecture on Wednesday mm -hmm. by Ian Goodfellow, who is the new professor of virology at Cambridge University, and he works on norovirus, the gut bug, and these particles are just 30 nanometers across, and in his lecture he's pointing out that every time someone is infectious with one of these diarrhea and vomiting bugs, every milliliter of what leaves their body contains anything up to a billion of these virus particles, and you only need 10 to infect someone. So mm. in other words, every milliliter of what comes upwards or downwards out of your body when you're being ill with one of these infections has got enough infectious doses in it to take down a hundred million people. It's quite a sobering thought, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, indeed it is. Let's go to Liesl in Fishhook. Hi. Hello. Yes. I wanted to know, I've heard that urine and perspiration are one and the same thing. Is that is that correct? Like they're made from the same material? Well, they, they are the same thing. Oh, okay. So I've heard. Chris? Hello, Liesl. Yes, well, hello. You're sort of on the right lines because when you make sweat, what is happening is that the blood in the skin is passing through very fine capillaries, tiny blood vessels, which have little holes in the walls of the blood vessels, and the watery bits of the blood filter out through the holes, rather like a coffee percolator, and the cells and some of the salts stay behind and a lot of the protein, and you end up with this ultra-filterate of the blood, which is then squirted out of the sweat pore onto the skin surface or the sweat, du the sweat duct, and it cools the skin down. When you make tears in your eyes, pretty much the same thing is done. 
and when you make saliva, pretty much the same thing is done. Obviously, on a much smaller scale than the kidney, which at any moment in time is getting something like a fifth of your blood flow. So a fifth of all of the blood pumped by your heart goes straight into your kidneys. And in the kidneys, there are many, many loops or little balls of capillaries. We call them glomeruli. And those capillaries filter out the blood and squirt the various constituents of the blood into uh, what we call a nephron. And that, that filtered material, which doesn't have any cells in it and very little protein, but does have lots of salts and sugars and things, then runs down in this duct inside the kidney called a tubule. And along the walls of the tubule, there are uh, specialised cells that have transporters on them that pick and choose, rather like things going along a conveyor belt. They pick out the things they want to bring back into the body. And in this way, you recycle the things you do want and you throw away the stuff that you don't want. And that's what makes the kidney so special. And it does that job absolutely amazingly for 70, 80 years. And so in some respects, urine and sweat are very similar. They're both mm. an ultra-filterative blood plasma. But they do have some important differences because in the kidney you're scavenging back a lot of the things that you don't want to throw away. And one other difference is that in some of these bodily secretions, like sweat and tears and saliva, the cells that line the ducts can sometimes add things to what's being thrown away, including antibodies or other protective chemicals to make sure those sites are kept safe. Mm -hmm. So Chris, tell me, which one smells better? Uh, I think the jury's out. But <laughs> urine, when it first comes out of the body, is completely sterile. Yeah. Skin isn't, and so you would you would not have um, you, you'd have far less threat to your health from drinking urine if it was fresh. I would say than drinking sweat, <laughs> as long as it was very dilute urine. But obviously, once the urine has sat around for a little while, then bugs mm. and things start to act act on it, and then it does get whiffy because there's a lot of nitrogen in there, and bugs like nitrogen. There's also a lot of phosphorus in urine, well, relatively speaking, and bugs like that. Too. So urine's a pretty good culture medium for bacteria. Here's a question here. Really, please ask Chris, why is facial ha hair harder than hair on my head? It's down to the characteristic of the keratin. Hair is made of keratin, which is a protein. It's the same stuff, actually, that you find in your nails, both fingernails and toenails. And the hair comes out of the hair follicle and it has a certain gauge or diameter which is determined by the ring of stem cells in the follicle that makes the hair or spins the hair and you can therefore change the characteristic of the hair by altering how much keratin um, is in there and how thick the hair is and uh, how it's spun together. And the hair follicles that make head hair are, and eyebrow hair or eyelash hair, they're all slightly different, so they tend to make a slightly different textured keratin and a thicker or thinner gauge keratin. And also, when you have beard, you tend to... Well, if people shave their face, then the hairs are always slightly shorter, and so they're just coming out through the skin when you feel them, and therefore they're supported, which makes them feel sharper and pricklier because they can't move as much, whereas when they've got a bit longer, they tend to taper and become thinner towards the end because they wear a bit. That's when people are stroking their beard. And also, once it's uh, sort of grown a bit longer, it, it can flop around a bit more, and so it feels uh, smoother. The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Riddy Clappy. At last, some leadership. We can't pontificate. We can't have PR stunts. Let them be suspended, investigated, and uh, they must face the full might of the law. A man is dead. It doesn't matter what he did. He resisted arrest, parked on the wrong side of the street. There are ways of subduing him. There are ways of arresting him within the confines of the law. We don't drag people behind moving cars and then they die inexplicably. A fit young man dying when he is in police custody. So the police officers and the station commander have been suspended and there'll be more um, uh, developments in our 10 o'clock news. Let's carry on with the Naked Scientist. Let's go to is it Jurgen in Sex and World. Hi there, Eddie. Mm. Um, I um Hydrogen vehicles seem to be the way of the future, and I was just thinking that years from now, if it is the way of the future, a dry city perhaps like Las Vegas or Los Angeles, um, if all the vehicles were replaced with hydrogen vehicles, um, would the, um, um, what do you call it, the uh, um, output of, of hydrogen vehicles affect the environment? Would it change a dry city into a more um, wet city, I guess? Hello, Jagan. Um The answer is probably not. 
partly because the amounts would still be quite small, but also when we burn hydrocarbons, in other words, things like diesel and petrol, they already, <coughs> excuse me, they already produce water as a combustion product because when you burn something which has got hydrogen and carbon in it in the presence of oxygen, you get CO2, carbon dioxide, and water. So carbon vehicles are already chucking out water. So if we were going to see big environmental effects, I think we'd have seen them. The, there, there is, it, it is true, though, to say that some vehicles do affect the weather and do affect rainfall because there was a paper published a couple of years ago by scientists showing that aeroplanes make it rain. Not for the reason you might expect, but the scientists were able to show that when the aeroplanes take off, they, as they go through a certain height above the ground, the pressure made around their wingtips, there's a pressure drop, so you have low atmospheric pressure. And this can cause um, the coalescing of lots of water droplets in the atmosphere into big raindrops, which will then begin to fall. And when they did plots of rainfall around some of the world's biggest airports, they found that down downwind of the airport, you do see an increased re rainfall relative to surrounding areas. But that's not because the aeroplanes are burning hydrogen. It's just because of local atmospheric effects that they trigger in passing. So vehicles can affect the weather, but not for the reason we might have thought about. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Thank you. In Sexton World and Carlo in Rietfontein. Hi. Morning, Lee. Mm. I want to know um, how they work that height above sea level. Height above uh, sea level. Yes, when you when, when you're building a, a when you build a building, they say it's one thousand five hundred feet above sea level or meters above sea level. Well, the tides is constantly changing. Okay. Hello, Carlo. Well, we've got a pretty good idea about the elevation of things now because people have done some pretty good mapping. But we also now have a tool which uh, our forebears didn't have, which is satellite imaging. And the Earth's surface is scrutinised in quite profound detail these days by surface radar. And... The, when scientists are now doing GPS uh, and seismic studies, so they're looking at how the ground is moving, they've got various monitoring uh, points on the Earth's surface where they are watching how those points are moving on the Earth's surface in order to track the movement of tectonic plates and so on. And the resolution of this is extremely high. And so you can get very, very accurate uh, detail of Earth's topography, height above sea level. There, there are even satellites that are monitoring the height of the sea, and you can, you can see wave height and things and, and ocean swell with some of these instruments. So they are absolutely stupendous. So we are very blessed these days to have amazing technology to do this mm. sort of thing for us. Chris, we'll chat to you next week. Stay away from the horse meat now. I'll do my best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> chat to you next week. And, of course, all our conversations with the Naked Scientist are available as podcasts.